Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Spark Power Corp Investor Call and Webcast. At this time, all participants have been placed on a listen-only mode, and the floor will be open for questions and comments after the presentation. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Richard Perry, CFO at Spark Power. Sir, the floor is yours. Good morning, and welcome to our 2022 first quarter conference call. I am joined today by Spark Power's President and CEO, Richard Jackson, Chief Investment Officer, Eric Waxman, and Tom Duncan, Chief Operating Officer. Rich Jackson will begin the morning with remarks on Q1 business highlights, and I will follow with a financial review of the first quarter. We will then have our usual Q&A session. Before we commence the review, I would remind you that our presentation contains certain forward-looking statements that are based on current expectations and are subject to a number of uncertainties and risks and actual results may differ materially. Further information identifying risks, uncertainties and assumptions and additional information on certain non-IFRS measures referred to in this call can be found in disclosure documents filed by the company with the securities regulatory authorities and available on CDAR.com. Further, these forward-looking statements are made as of the date of this call, and except as expressly required by applicable law, Spark Power assumes no obligation to publicly update or revise any forward-looking statement, whether a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. With that, I will turn the call over to Spark's President and CEO, Rich Jackson, for his opening comments. Thanks, Richard. Good morning, and welcome to Spark's uh, 2022 first quarter earnings conference call. Thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. While Spark continues to face significant macro level headwinds in Q1, we achieved record quarterly revenue and as expected, we are seeing early signs of margin recovery coupled with continued strong demand for our services. Our teams continue to manage tightly through the final stages of the pandemic, the impacts of rapidly rising inflation and the company's capital structure all while transitioning the company into an integrated platform. I'm grateful to all of our stakeholders for the continued patience and confidence you have in our team. As always, I want to thank our employees for their strong perseverance through unprecedented times. We certainly have a great team. Spark is in a strategic transition moving from our beginnings into a mature, integrated, and predictable organization. When I jumped into the CEO seat, one of my priorities was to continue to invest in leadership and attracting experienced leaders to support me in this transition and to lead Spark through the maturity curve. I am focused on ensuring we have the right people in the right roles and the right leaders who have the right mix of professional experience to deliver on our operational strategy and creative approaches to deliver premium solutions for our customers. In Q1, I was pleased to bring on April Curry as our new Vice President of Sales and Marketing. April is working hard to commercialize Spark and to set a very intentional and more enhanced go-to-market strategy for the company. John Krill also joined us to lead the Spark Power Canadian operations. In his capacity, John oversees our Canadian business units and the execution of service delivery and ultimate P&L experience for the organization. April and John come to Spark with significant industry experience and they, along with other members of my team, are set to move Spark forward. Indeed, our entire senior leadership team has been completely revamped in just the last nine months. Speaking of sales and marketing, in Q1, we launched several new commercialization initiatives to bring scalability, operational efficiency, and predictability to our organization. Some of these initiatives include a refinement of our target market and segmentation, critical reviews of our services offering, pricing standardization and management, developing a fully integrated and standardized sales team, and ultimately national account management programs. In Q1, we were also pleased by the successful closing of our rights offering and the combined $39.6 million of equity financing, primarily from the founders and our three new institutional investors. The success of this funding really speaks to the vote of confidence our institutional investors have in Spark and the legacy we are building. The injection of this additional capital will be used to execute on our operational strategy with a focus on scalability and expansion opportunities. I'd like to highlight that in Q1, there was continued momentum around the integration of our acquired companies under the OneSpark operating platform. Project Darwin is on track for a phased rollout throughout 2022, 
and will change the way Spark conducts its business operations, delivering key business process standardization and improvements across every level of our enterprise, from field data collection right through to billings. Through this business process and system integration, we anticipate being able to deliver a stronger, more value-based and consistent customer experience. The launch of Project Darwin will allow us to function cohesively as one Spark. As part of the integration of the business, Spark also expects to complete a final organizational integration in its technical services and renewable segments, bringing the organization into a common management structure. The company will continue to operate a regional organizational structure, but the common operating management for both business segments will provide for better efficiencies in workforce management, support of the standardization of key business processes, and the right sizing of the sg and cost structure in business operations across the operating business unit. In Q1, we began making these changes and expect to have our integrated organization fully in place by the end of 2022. This also includes a streamlining of our head office functions and ensuring that once we have closed out on Project Darwin, we have a very scalable SG&A cost base to support the next growth phase for Spark. As CEO, I'm incredibly proud of the progress and the recovery we have made since last quarter. I'm also very proud to be leading such a resilient team. Achieving record quarterly revenue in Q1 while navigating significant headwinds is an indicator that we are on track to continue our strong record of organic growth. This coupled with our margin improvement activities and continued cost realignment related to integration gives us the right recipe for a robust, profitable path forward through the balance of 2022 and beyond. And to be clear, we intend to grow profitably and sustainably and not grow for the sake of growth. I will now turn the call over to Spark CFO, Richard Perry, to share our Q1 financial results. Richard. Thank you, Rich. I am pleased to report sequential growth quarter on quarter for both revenues and adjusted EBITDA margins as we execute on our plans to improve margin realization and rationalize our cost structure. Gross margin realizations were 23.7% and reflect the strong revenue growth in the quarter coupled with the early returns of various margin enhancement initiatives that we implemented in the quarter. At the same time, we implemented targeted cost actions to right-size our SG&A cost base moving forward. While there is more work to be done, the first quarter showed positive momentum building into Q2. During the first quarter, we reported revenue of 70 million as compared to 56 million in Q1 2021 and 65.4 million in Q4 2021, representing increases of 25% and 7% respectively. Revenue growth was related to increasing volumes in our Canadian and US tech services businesses and ongoing momentum in our renewables and sustainability segments. In our technical services segment, revenues were up 9.6 million as compared to Q1 of last year, representing an increase of 26.8% over the prior year, and up 20.7% over Q4 2021. The growth reflects strong project work in Eastern Canada combined with ramping volumes in the U.S. market. Our renewable segment continues to deliver strong organic growth with revenues increasing by 3.4 million or 20% over the prior year tied to increasing demand for solar energy in the U.S. market. Our sustainability segment continued to post strong growth and was up 37.8% in the quarter over the prior year and up 65.2% over Q4 2021 accounting for over 5.4% of total quarterly revenue. Gross margin, excluding non-cash depreciation and amortization, was 23.7% in Q1 2022, up 4.5% from Q4 2021, and down over prior year, in part due to government subsidies recognized in 2021. The drivers to this recovery include operational improvements in executing fieldwork, preliminary benefits of targeted margin initiatives that were implemented in the quarter, and estimate updates in the fourth quarter of 2021 not experienced in the current quarter. Although we have realized margin improvements, we continue to confront the cost of inflation impacts on our cost of goods, as well as the impact of COVID-19 protocols on labor productivity in the field. We expect these headwinds to subside through the balance of year as we realize the full benefits of our margin expansion initiatives. 
selling general and administration costs exclusive of the impact of depreciation and amortization were $13.8 million, down $1.3 million, or 8.6% from Q4 2021. In the quarter, the company executed targeted cost actions to right-size our SG&A cost base as part of our broader plan to expand EBITDA margins. More specifically, an estimated $4.5 million of annualized selling, general, and administration cost savings were executed through the start of Q2. As stated in previous quarters, we are focused on delivering scale in our operating model and driving efficiencies to support the next phase of our growth strategy. The work on our integrated business processes and technology platform continues to progress well, and through the second half of 22, we'll move into production. This is an important next step in the evolution of our business and will deliver business standardization and scalability across the entire Spark Power portfolio. During the first quarter, the company's reported adjusted EBITDA was $2.8 million, or 4% of revenue, in Q1 2022, and $3.9 million, or 5.6% of revenue, on a pro forma basis considering the SG&A actions executed in the f- first quarter, as compared to $2.5 million, or 3.6% of revenue, in Q4 2021. During the first quarter of 2022, the company deployed a portion of the proceeds from the rights offering to reduce accounts payable and settle certain outstanding vendor notes. As a result, cash flow from operations was a use of $13.2 million in the quarter. Capital expenditures in the quarter were $0.9 million and was spread across all classes of property, plant, and equipment. During the quarter, the company satisfied $2.1 million of debt obligations to its lender under its term debt facility and principal payments towards vehicle and premises lease liabilities of $2 million. The net result of cash flows was a decrease in bank indebtedness of $12.1 million in the quarter. The company had approximately $17.7 million of liquidity on its operating line at March 31, 2022. The company completed its rights offering and contemporaneous private placement in early Q1 2022 for aggregate subscription proceeds of approximately $39.6 million. This injection provided Spark Power with the additional capital to reduce debt, strengthen our balance sheet, and execute on our operational strategy, which includes completing integration initiatives and future expansion opportunities. At the end of the first quarter of 2022, total debt outstanding to our lender decreased by $15 million to $76.8 million. In closing, I am pleased with the record quarterly revenue we achieved in Q1 and the early signs of margin recovery that started to take hold. With the tailwinds of the equity injection of $39.6 million and the continued support of our lender, Spark will continue forward with the final stages of the wholesale integration of all acquired companies under our one Spark platform. I am confident that as we continue to execute on our margin expansion initiatives, and realize the benefits of our integration plan, Spark will be positioned well for scalability and profitable long-term growth. Lastly, I am also pleased with the progress we have made to strengthen our financial reporting processes, and I want to acknowledge the team for their commitment and dedication to a more robust approach. With that, this concludes our prepared remarks. I will now turn the call over to our operator for questions. Operator, please go ahead. Certainly. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is now open for questions. If you have any questions or comments, please press star 1 on your phone at this time. We ask that while posing your question, you please pick up your handset if listening on speakerphone to provide optimum sound quality. Once again, please press star 1 if there are questions at this time. Please hold while we poll for questions. And we did have a question come in from Matthew Lee from Canaccord Genuity. Matthew, your line is live. Hey, hi guys. So revenue and gross margin are pretty good this quarter, but SGNA really has seemed to jump. So maybe you can start by explaining some of the puts and takes around, you know, labor cost increases that you're seeing. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Matt, for the uh, the question. So um, you're referencing the increase in SGNA year over year. 
And so uh, for sure, when you look at staffing costs uh, in terms of sort of targeted increases, we have made some investments from a sales and marketing perspective. Rich talked a little bit about um, some of the work underway in terms of bolstering our marketing uh, approach and uh, starting to increase our presence both in the Canadian and U.S. markets from a sales channel perspective, as well as some of the demand gen uh, initiatives. So uh, that for sure would be uh, one area that we continue to uh, expand in. Uh, secondly, you know, as part of our integration efforts and starting to move to a one Spark platform, we do continue to invest in some shared services that over time will allow us to uh, increase efficiency and ultimately sort of streamline some of the order to cash processes that today sort of take place in the field and uh, over time sort of move to a more shared services model. So that's just a couple of examples uh, where we've made some investments from an SG&A perspective, Matt, that causes some of the increase from a year over year perspective. I would also note, of course, uh, further to my comments, if you look at sort of the movement in SG&A from where we were as we ended the year in Q4, uh, certainly, you know, we are starting to see the, uh, the reductions from an SG&A perspective. That coupled with the cost actions that were taken through the quarter into the early part of Q2 will absolutely set up uh, our SG&A base moving forward. Great. That's helpful. Um, maybe a follow-up to that. You know, when are you expecting to see even a margin get back into the double-digit range? Is that kind of a back half of the year thing or maybe into 2023? And then just maybe given the change in mix of your business, what sort of even margins are you comfortable with long term? Yeah, so again, a great question, Matt. So as we outlook uh, into sort of the back half of the year, uh, we absolutely anticipate that EBITDA margins will crest over the double digit mark uh, through the, uh, the back half. Again, sort of tied to both revenue growth as well as the margin expansion initiatives and, and the work being done from an SG&A cost-based perspective. Um, as we sort of look beyond 2022 and, and think about sort of uh, long-term targeted uh, EBITDA margins, you know, we anticipate that we should be in the low teens uh, moving forward, and that really is sort of where our focus is, um, the plan, the initiatives, and ultimately tied to our growth strategy. Great, and then maybe just lastly, a bigger picture question. You know, with the equity raise now behind us, how comfortable are you with the current balance sheet and your ability to reach your operational goals with the capital you have, as well as keeping your lenders happy? Yeah, so I, uh, I'm feeling really good, uh, Matt, regarding sort of uh, where we are in, in the balance sheet. Obviously, the capital injection was very important for us, uh, very significant at just under $40 million, uh, allowed us to, as I mentioned in my comments, sort of reduce some, some debt on the balance sheet, uh, strengthen uh, other parts of the balance sheet, uh, earmark some dollars to support working capital needs, and, uh, and ultimately allow us to be able to execute not just the 2022 plan, uh, but also allow us and position us to be able to execute our longer-term growth strategy. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate the call. Thank you. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, if there were any other questions from the lines, please go ahead and press star one at this time. Once again, if you have any questions from the lines, please press star one at this time. And we did have another question come in from Paul Tepish from High Rock Capital. Paul, your line is live. Thank you. Um, Congratulations on great revenue growth and getting your credit facility waived. Uh, I, I have a question as well around SGNA, um, including uh, DNA. It looked like you were darn close to 16 million in the first quarter. Um, of that, roughly 9 million is from segment uh, SGNA, and then roughly 6 million is for corporate costs. SGNA. So where are the, you know, annualizing that out? It's about 60 million. I think you give guidance that you'll be around 48 to 50 million this year. So where are the savings going to come from? From segment uh, SGNA or from head office? Yeah. So uh, thanks, Paul, for uh, for the question. Um, so from an SGNA perspective. 
you know, we uh, are trending in and around 13 and a half to 14 million uh, a quarter is sort of where our, our trends um, are running at. And the split that you reference between segment versus corporate, um, you know, for sure the work that is underway is um, sort of targeting both segment as well as corporate uh, SG&A. Um, we have a number of, uh, of opportunities. Uh, I mentioned some of the work being done from a uh, sort of shared services perspective to build that out. Uh, we have work underway as it relates to sort of looking at our real estate footprint and trying to optimize uh, what that real estate uh, footprint looks like moving forward. Um, we have work around some of the, obviously the discretionary spend, some of the professional fees. So all that is, is work underway uh, as we outlook, you know, um, that range of 48 to 50 million, that is our targeted range um, based on sort of where we are trending now, the cost actions that have been taken through Q1 into the start of Q2, uh, as well as some of the additional work as we accelerate the benefits of integration uh, in part tied to Project Darwin, which is our uh, enterprise-wide system integration. So those are really the, the key opportunities uh, in play right now for us that will sort of reset our cost base uh, through the balance of 22, as well as uh, I think really setting us up as we outlook beyond 22 into 23 uh, moving forward. And ultimately, you know, the, the objective is creating scale, uh, driving efficiencies, and really allowing us to sort of repurpose and reallocate dollars to continue to drive revenue growth and ultimately margin expansion. Okay, great. Well, if, if you can get it down there, I, I, I would note too that I mean, six million per quarter on head office costs in a decentralized business uh, seems awfully high at a, you know, an annualized rate of twenty-four million dollars a year for for a company this big. So, if you can get uh, get those down, I can see how uh, margins can improve rather dramatically here and quickly. Um, maybe another question or two. Um, Material cost inflation seem to be a problem related to these larger contracts that you had. Um, how are you going to alleviate those, or is there any way to pass them on, as well as these subcontractor costs? Uh, do you have escalation clauses in place now, or are you avoiding those type of contracts, or what are you doing to offset that? Thanks, Paul. It's Rich Jackson. Yeah, so um, we've been grappling with the inflationary uh, challenges over the last four or five months, and obviously um, it's no secret. I think everyone's kind of grappling with it. Um, a few things have happened in the business internally uh, to help manage it. One is Tom and myself have laid out clear instructions to all of our teams. Uh, there's just certain uh, pockets of, of the market we're not going to play in and, uh, and push back on some of the type of work that perhaps we would have taken through the pandemic when we were a little bit lighter on backlog. Uh, so a couple of examples of that would be larger fixed price projects where uh, we wanted to keep labor off the bench and out in the field, uh, which typically come with, you know, larger material components and so on. Um, we're not taking, we're, we're being a little bit more uh, uh, cautious around taking that type of work in the, the current climate. The second thing I would say that's really uh, uh, helping us is we've raised uh, our material cost structures in the business system um, uh, to offset the impacts of inflation to give us a, a, a buffer. And, and then the additional, additional piece to that would be uh, surcharges. And, you know, industry-wide, we're starting to see the same thing, uh, uh, surcharges on fuel, surcharges on material, specifically around commodity pricing. Obviously, a lot of work we do is uh, centered around uh, copper. Um, so uh, we've, we've launched that uh, for the most part in Q1, and you'll see that sort of translate through the business. We, we have a 90 to 120 day period of when we uh, estimate a project or a small job through to when it, it goes through the billing cycle. So I expect to see that play out. And then obviously, of course, just general um, uh, charge out rate increases and price increases at large. We continue to do that. We, we uh, We've done three now. Uh, we'll, we'll likely do another one here in Q2 and continue to monitor how the market responds uh, to that. So a lot of blocking and tackling, I would say, in the business to manage around it. It's, it's been a challenge. Um, but I'm confident that we've laid out 
you know, the, the kind of the, the granular uh, processes, um, at least to react, at the very least to react to what's going on in the global market. Uh, but certainly uh, the long-term play would be, you know, um, ensuring that our, our systems and our, our business processes uh, support and, and, uh, and address these kinds of issues going forward. That's great. Well, thank you very much. And it sounds like you're both on top of things. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. And there were no other questions in queue at this time. I would now like to hand the call back to Richard Jackson, CEO of Spark Power, for some closing remarks. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, so I, I just want to uh, send a, you know, a, a big thank you out again to all of our employees. Uh, we're, we're, you know, obviously uh, going through some pretty unprecedented uh, times, you know, starting with the pandemic and, and then dealing with some of the uh, macro level impacts of inflation and so on. Uh, so I really, uh, you know, want to emphasize we have a great team. Uh, they're a resilient team, and we uh, continue to, to ride through this together. And the other thing I'd like to do is just uh, thank our stakeholders, you know, our, our lending partners, our new institutional investors, our founders. Um, you know, Spark is a really good business going through a real uh, uh, transition and, uh, you know, uh, focusing on the long game and seeing where we're going as a business. I have all the confidence in our team to deliver and uh, the confidence of the stakeholder community uh, to continue uh, uh, giving us the patience, the time, the space, the support. Uh, to, to get us through to the other side. So I just wanted to leave off on that. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This does conclude today's conference. You may disconnect your phone lines at this time and have a wonderful day. Thank you for your participation.